Good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Catherine Carr, the president of the Grouse Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this 2019 Forbes lecture. Before I begin the introduction, though, I have three very important things to tell you. Please turn off your cell phones and, the, and or their ringers. Also, the lecture, as you'll notice from the slides behind me, is, is recorded, and so you can look at it again. And it's also simulcast at, um, at the web address that's every now and then on the screen. And then finally, I should remind you that the Grass Foundation invites you to a reception after the lecture in the Meigs room. We'd be lovely, be lovely to see you. Now, but as is traditional with the Forbes lecturer, um, we, before I introduce our speaker, Gilles Laurent, um, I would like to speak briefly about both the Grass Foundation and then about Alexander Forbes, about after, for whom this lecture series is named. And then um, I would also like to mention two other greats um, to you tonight, Werner Lorenstein and John Moore. But I'm going to begin with a brief introduction to the Grass family for those of you who are not familiar with them. If I could, I think, here we go. There we go. I knew that, I knew, I knew that Albert and Ellen would pop up. Um, so Albert and, and Albert and Ellen Grass first met in 1935 in the physiology department at Harvard, and they were married the year after. Albert was an engineer who spearheaded the design and fabrication of the first EEG machine in 1935. And since then, EEG machines have played an indispensable part in the diagnosis of epilepsy and other disorders. Ellen was a scientist. She got her AB and Masters from Radcliffe and was a PhD at student at Harvard when they met studying electrophysiology of auditory cortex. After her marriage, however, she, she left graduate school to work with Albert full time to find, found the Grass Instrument Company. And it's the success of that company and the, this wonderful combination of scientists and engineer from, the, from the, the two grasses that have led to this lecture series because the EG machine was um, a very successful part of neuroscience, it still is today. One of their, um, their, their boss at the time, and the, one of the first trustees of the Grass Foundation is Alexander Forbes, from, for whom this series is named. He has a picture of, of Forbes. Um, he, he was one of the founders of neurophysiology, credited with building the first vacuum tube amplifier for physiology experiments. And um, he got almost all his education at Harvard but after he finished his degree, he then moved to England to do neuro some very classic neurophysiology experiments. You can see him here in a later picture with Lord Adrian, Sir Charles Sherrington, and then um, Forbes on the right. Um, and, and in his, those first pioneering experiments in, in England, he went on to, he made the first electrical recordings of nerve action potentials um, using a string galvanometer. Forbes was a, when he returned to Harvard, um, was a fix, fixture in the summer at the MBL, not only because he was an MBL scientist, but also because the Forbes family um, owns most of most Narshan Island and the Elizabeth Islands. <laughs> the, just, um, and then, not to mention, not to, I would like to talk more about Forbes, who was a truly great man, but I would like to put some time at the beginning of this introduction to somebody who many of you will remember very fondly, and that's Werner Lohenstein. Here, here are a couple of pictures of Werner in his trademark black beret. He, um, as many of you know, he and Birgit Rose Lohenstein were scientists here in the summers. And he died five years ago, and the family are, have come back here to, to remember him, and you'll find them at the reception. I've got one more slide of, of, of Werner um, in, in, in their, 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 their yacht, Pequod, yes, Werner and, and, and Birgit. Um, in addition to being a very distinguished biophysicist, Werner also wrote um, 
a very wonderful book, The Physics, Physics in Mind, um, chosen by Physics World as the best book in physics in 2013, and a book that provided a prescient view of, of the grow, growing world of quantum computing. Um, Werner survived by his wife of 43 years, Birgit Rose Lowenstein, and some, some children. Like I mentioned, you can hope, meet them at the reception. Um, he's, I think, will be is greatly missed. And now to, to move on to the, to the main event. It's my great pleasure to introduce the 2019 Forbes lecturer, Gilles Laurent. Um, Gilles is currently director of the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research in Frankfurt. And his re research is, um, combines both a strong experimental and computational component with an emphasis on using simple systems to understand neural coding and neural computations, as well as brain evolution. He's going to talk to us tonight about some of his recent research on the control and development of, of skin patterning, patterning in cuttlefish, and some work on the ideas about the evolution of the vertebrate brain. But I first met Scheel in 1990 when he came to Caltech as a, um, an assistant professor, where he carried out groundbreaking work on the coding of smell. In 2009, he and um, his wife, Erin Schumann, moved to be directors at the Max Planck in Frankfurt. Um, and um, you may remember Erin Schumann from the Forbes lecture she gave three years ago. You, um, 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 they, in addition, they, you, they're both here tonight. You may meet them again at the reception, along with their three um, daughters. Um, Gilles' lecture, you'll, can, you'll see the title up here, Cephalopods, Visual Perception, Motor Control, and Brain Evolution. Gilles, it's a great pleasure to have you. And on behalf of the Grass Foundation, it's my great honor to present you with this plaque. Thank you very much, You're Catherine. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to you, and thank you very much to uh, MBL and the uh, Forbes Lecture Series to invite me. It's a great pleasure and a great honor for me to be talking to you today about some of the work that my lab is involved in. I don't know where to put this. I don't want to put it on the ground. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, before I, I start talking about science, I, I wanted to say a few things about Woods Hole, about uh, the Grass Foundation. Um, I have known and uh, been coming to Woods Hole now for over 30 years. I took the computational and uh, neural systems course in 1989, before I started my job at uh, Caltech. I've uh, participated in teaching in um, the NSNB course, in the neurobiology course. Uh, I was very fortunate to be uh, here three years ago while Erin uh, gave her Forbes lecture. Um, Roger Hanlon here gave me some space in his, on his uh, lab uh, to carry out some experiments um, that would be related to what I'll talk about here. And um, these 30 years of experience with Woods Hole have been uh, an integral part of the science that I do and the way I do science. And so as a result, it's been extremely important to my own career and, and scientific development. Um, I think that Woods Hole um, represents a, a, one of the pillars of the way in which uh, one should do science. A very important part of science is um, the exploration of nature, especially true for natural scientists, obviously. And it's a part of uh, science that is often not thought about, and I think not thought about enough or supported enough by the funders in general, before you can uh, propose a hypothesis and propose ways to test that hypothesis. You have to um, have some evidence, and um, nature has this way of surprising us with things that we don't predict, and that's true in biology as it is in physics. Um, and so, to me, Woods Hole, MBL, the way in which science is done here represents exactly that phase of science. Not only that, but that phase of science where we can just come and uh, 
do fun stuff, exploring things without having uh, preconceived ideas about what we'll find. I think that's tremendously important. Um, Erin said in her lecture uh, three years ago that uh, Woods Hole was a national treasure. I can only repeat this. I think that this place uh, is a national treasure that is treasured by people not only in the US but around the planet. Um, so I want to thank Woods Hole, I want to thank the MBL, I want to thank all of you and the Grass Foundation to uh, enable this kind of uh, playground for all the scientists, that many of whom are here today. Before I start, I would also like to spend just a minute to remember Susan Eaton. Uh, many of you know her, were friends or colleagues of hers, and she tragically passed away as a result of a tragic, senseless incident uh, in Crete um, during a meeting that she was attending two weeks ago. And um, I would just like to um, give this talk in memory of, of Susan. So I am interested in the way brains work. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you? Because I can't hear myself. Yes? OK. Uh, yeah? I, I can roam, yeah, but the, the, the sound is coming from, <laughs> from here. I'm just checking that the sound is good. OK. So. Um, I'm interested in, in, in brains and the ways in which brains work. And as Catherine said, I'm interested in working on those particular problems on a variety of model systems, often not classical model systems. And I've become, through working on those systems, very interested in the evolution of brains. And so I thought that I would start talking about evolution in general and starting at the very beginning. So our universe is about 14 billion years old. Um, and um, our solar system was uh, created sometime about 5 billion years ago. Our solar system is, evolves around a, a star, the sun, uh, which is an average star in an average uh, spiral galaxy. Uh, it's about halfway through its life cycle, so we're about halfway through these 10 billion years that the sun will exist. And the amazing thing that keeps amazing me still, as I've known it for quite a while now, is that life is nearly as old as the Earth is. The Earth was created something like um, uh, 4.6 or so uh, billion years ago, and life defined in the most uh, uh, generous way, if you will, as uh, self-replicating molecules with some noise enabling change and evolution, has probably existed for just under 4 billion years. These numbers will evolve most likely as we discover more and more. Most of uh, life history, so these 4 billion years before now, um, have been basically a period of evolution and invention of molecular mechanisms, uh, most of which uh, in prokaryotic cells, meaning single cells without a, a, a nuclear membrane. About two billion years ago, eukaryotes evolved, so a more elaborate type of cell organization, unicellular first, eventually leading to uh, multicellular organisms, plants and animals, about a billion years ago or so. The first nerve nets, you couldn't call them brains yet, but nets, networks of neurons and specialized cells, probably arose something like seven, six to 700 million years ago. And what we're studying today, all of us, is the remnant of this long history of evolution. Okay. The future from now is about five billion years for our solar system, but in fact, the sun will heat up increasingly as we go. And by some estimates, uh, life on the surface of the Earth will probably be able to survive only for about 300 million years. The life will return, plus or minus maybe 100 million years, will return to the oceans after that. Okay? So, the amount of living 
brains on the surface of this earth is way shorter than what comes and came before us. Sort of interesting to think about. Nervous systems, as I said, um, evolved for the past um, six or seven hundred million years. We have now animals and species that give us ideas about what they look like. The most simple nervous systems are things that you see in jellyfish that contain a few hundred to a few thousand neurons. Um, the brains of invertebrates, including this one, the fly, other invertebrates, and I'll talk about one, contain on the order of thousands to hundreds of thousands to, as you'll see, hundreds of millions of neurons. And then vertebrate brains, including mammalian, including the human brain, uh, contain even more neurons. You see here uh, the tree of life that represents the evolution of these living systems from um, the beginning of life here. And around 600 and 540, so, a million years ago happened what's called the Cambrian explosion where there was a massive diversification of body plants and species and therefore nervous systems. And so I'll talk a little more about this. We talk, when we talk about the brain, very often we think about the human brain and a lot of the research that goes on today about human brains, mammalian brain, uh, takes place in this animal species, which is the lab mouse. But in fact, a lot of things, if not most of what we know about the basics of the nervous system is the result of research that's been done on a wide variety of animal systems. And the reason it's possible is, of course, linked to the evolution of living systems and brains. Here you have a variety of species, among many others, that have been used for neuroscience over the past century. Some of them prominent here at Woods Hole. The squid, for research, for example, on axonal conduction, ionic conductances through, uh, um, uh, for, for the generation of the action potential and electrical signals in neurons. The horseshoe crab, uh, worked by uh, Hartline. Um, for, for example, the discovery of lateral inhibition, a very classical and important process for contrast enhancement in the retina and many other places in the brain. And I could go on describing the work, very classical and very general and applicable generally in other model systems. So when you have an evolutionary perspective on nervous systems, um, you can look at two, at least, uh, uh, viewpoints on what you can learn through evolution. And those are inheritance and convergence. As I was saying earlier, the early billion years of life were a period of invention of molecular mechanisms. Um, the proteins, ion channels, receptors, all the things that we use in our nervous systems were mostly invented by bacteria. It's a very long period of invention. At the time of the Cambrian explosion, a few other uh, uh, eras during this uh, early period of, of life, um, occurred a period of diversification and as a result, enormous complexification. But the amazing thing is that this complexification and this diversification of systems had to evolve within the same constraints defined by the physics of the world, which we all share. So these common constraints on these different evolving nervous systems have led to sets of solutions by convergence, even when uh, the ancestral systems and ancestral brains did not, had not yet found those solutions. An example, a classical example, is the evolution of the single lens eye, our eye. That eye has been invented many times, 10, 12 times, as far as we know, uh, throughout evolution, and obeys a very similar optical design. The neural design behind it varies, but this convergence of a design is something which is extremely useful to know, so as to understand the reason nervous systems are built the way they are. So this kind of thinking is something that's uh, intrinsic in the way in which many of us in this room actually think about neuroscience and nervous systems. So 
this convergence indicates principles that are in some ways independent of the implementation that is used by each one of these nervous systems. So even when they use circuits that differ, the principles underlying the way in which the solutions are being found are similar. And I find that way of thinking about the brain and understanding the brain extremely important. And this is why it is important to work on a variety of model systems. Of course, there are differences because each species evolves so as to identify its own niche. Uh, and those differences are themselves very interesting. And in fact, they become very useful to neuroscientists, biologists in general, to find very peculiar solutions uh, that otherwise would not be found. So I'll give a few examples of this inheritance aspect and the convergence. So in the case of structural inheritance, I think it's really important to talk, for example, about synapses, which are the junctions between neurons that are intrinsic to the way in which neural nets work. And this was the topic of uh, Aaron's talk three years ago. So a synapse in a vertebrate brain is an extremely complicated uh, complex of many proteins on the order of uh, one to several thousand such proteins have been identified. But when one looks at where those proteins are found in animals throughout evolution, one finds them, for example, in certain cell types found in sponges. Now, sponges don't have a brain, sponges don't have neurons, they don't have a nervous system. Yet you find in those cells a very large fraction of the proteins that form the complex that form a synapse in a modern synapse in a typical nervous system. So this is work that was done in Ken Kosek's lab uh, uh, a little over 10 years ago. And other labs in France here did work on coanoflagellates, which are single cell organisms related to sponges, but preceding the invention of metazoans. And those single cell organisms also possess within their cells the complement of proteins that form those of these cells in sponges and synapses in nervous systems. What this tells us is that the way in which synapses are formed and the complex of, of elements that form a synapse were actually invented and used prior to the invention of synapses, neurons, and nervous systems. It tells us something very profound about the way in which evolution works, which is that it tends to co-opt stuff that has already been used and invented for other purposes, for new purposes. It also tells us that maybe the way in which nervous systems are organized is not always optimized, because it's not design de novo, but simply as a way of reorganizing something that already exists so as to make something new that's useful and adaptive. So that's also something which I think is very important to know as a biologist uh, when looking at biology. So if you look at the modern uh, fraction of the modern complements of a, of a synapse, the details don't matter. Uh, you see in red the things that are the most ancient, and then in other colors those that have been added uh, throughout evolution to eventually form a real synapse. So that's an example of inheritance of properties uh, of nervous systems. Now a second example to illustrate convergence. So many of us in this room know about um, the action potential, which is this digital pulse that is used by nervous systems uh, to communicate within cell and between cells. It's an electrical pulse that's about uh, millisecond in duration, about a tenth of a volt in amplitude, which you find all over the place and all over most animals. Uh, classic biophysical work was done thanks to J.Z. Young, whose picture is outside of this auditorium, you'll see him, who in the 30s told a number of biophysicists, among whom H uh, Hodgkin and Huxley, you guys should work on this animal, the squid, because it has a gigantic axon in which you could do the experiments you want to do. This gigantic axon has a diameter of about a millimeter, and you can do experiments you could not do on a normal neuron. So, this basically is an electrical pulse that you find in a squid as well as a human brain. This is the way, the currency, which neurons use to communicate. Now, a few years ago, 
This lab working on bacterial populations forming biofilms, so two-dimensional populations of bacteria with millions and millions of individuals, looking at them so that in conditions of growth, uh, where so many individuals are in the same biofilm, uh, that there are problems of access to nutrients and some coordination has to be uh, uh, put in among those populations, among the individuals. So they look for this and they observe that these cells actually communicate with one another through electrical signals. Their electrical signals are that the result of an ion flux through their membrane, just the same way as this, except simpler, mainly with potassium, which you can measure by measuring potassium concentration or uh, voltage across the membrane. So basically the principle is the same, and you can see these pulses here. There's a big difference though. Those pulses, instead of being a millisecond long here, they're 30 minute long. It's very slow, very low bandwidth, Imagine having a conversation with you know, the bacteria at that speed. By the time you finish your sentence, the bacteria has evolved into a fish. <laughs> so this is a principle. This is a principle of digital communication invented several times uh, at different time scales, but whose underlying principle is the same. And Looking at nervous system in a variety of systems, nervous or not, as you saw, uh, is very instructive. So now something about the modern history of neuroscience very quickly, but just to give you an idea of the technological enhancements that have led to where we are today. Neuroscience has existed for uh, about a century or so. Um, as you can see, people didn't smile much a century ago. Um, you see here uh, Cecil and um, Oscar Vogt, who were the first directors at our institute. It was then in Berlin. And you see here Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who is really the founder of, of neuroscience and um, using a technique developed by um, Camillo Golgi, um, arrived at the description of the unit of computation within the nervous system, which is the neuron. We are now in a radically different period of neuroscience, which we would call a, a golden age. It's a science which, as opposed to that period, which was mainly neuroanatomy, um, is interdisciplinary, with people coming from mathematics, physics, computer science, biology, molecular biology, psychology, all of these different disciplines working together towards understanding how the brain works. The technology has uh, developed tremendously, uh, giving us the ability to uh, describe the molecular components of brains, image activity, uh, record from many, many neurons at the same time, manipulate neurons using light, a uh, very large number of techniques that uh, didn't exist even 20 years ago. So it's absolutely fabulous. And then finally, enormous development in computational uh, uh, properties and, and, and substrate, allowing us to do a type of analyses in an automated fashion that could never be done in the past. So this period is very special, and what I'll say in the next few talks is that to some extent we're deluged with data and finding it, at least for me, increasingly difficult to figure out how things work because we just have too much data. So I think that there's, we're entering a period where we have to think a little to go beyond this amazing these amazing advantages given by technology. So an example, uh, one of the major model systems of neuroscience now is, is this small fish, the uh, zebra fish, in which you can, for example, express uh, a GFP within its entire nervous system or within a very select group of neurons. You can map the, uh, the projections of all these neurons and describe the entire nervous system of this thing in infinite detail. You can even do that now with electron microscopy so as to know the exact connection diagram of this entire nervous system. You can do this with human brains as well, and this is an example of, of uh, a particular kind of, of uh, MRI uh, imaging of the human brain. 
uh, in this case, the communication between left and right hemispheres. But as I was saying, we are now faced with an enormous mass of knowledge, but not necessarily uh, much more understanding of how brains really work. I'm not being critical of this mass of knowledge. It is necessary, but it is clearly not sufficient. And one reason is that we're dealing with a science of systems, meaning interacting things that work together. And whenever you look at a science of systems, new properties arise. You cannot deduce biology from the knowledge of chemistry. You cannot deduce psychology from the, 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 the knowledge of molecular biology. These things operate at different levels with new rules. And for the young people here who are interested, I recommend, highly recommend this, this paper by Phil Anderson that describes why that is, that more is different, and that's certainly very true in the nervous system. So we are now at a phase where when we study the nervous system, we can use a, a number of different uh, approaches. And one of them is basically to be exhaustive, select a few model systems. Here are some of the favorite ones, uh, C. elegans, uh, Drosophila, zebrafish, the mouse, develop genetic techniques to, uh, to manipulate them, and then describe everything you can describe. And in fact, we can describe nearly everything now. You can describe uh, the molecular components at, at uh, the genomic level, transcriptomic level, proteomic level, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can describe these neural circuits in infinite detail. You can also describe automatically using techniques of, of machine learning and, and, and novel uh, computational techniques uh, behavior and train those networks to recognize particular behaviors and cluster them in ways that the human eye actually finds very difficult. Fantastic. We can do this, but it is not sufficient to understand how things work. So another way of doing things, the way that I'm talking about tonight, um, is to be selective and to look for patterns. So if you think about the evolution of chemistry, you'll know about Mendeleev. And Mendeleev had this amazing intuition about the structure of uh, chemical components and basically started ordering chemicals in a way that to him made sense that predicted the existence of elements that were not known at the time. This is an incredible feat. He was not the only one actually to have done so, but it is an amazing uh, predictive part of science that is the result of the recognition, the identification of some pattern, some structure in the data. And so we have to be able to find this, I think, if we want to understand the brain. And I think that working on just a few systems and being even exhaustive about them is not sufficient. We have to look for patterns and we have to look at evolution and well-selected model system to arrive at that. So that's more or less my philosophy and how uh, I work and the kind of work we do. And uh, one of the things that interests me in particular is the dynamics of nervous system. So my lab has worked on the dynamics of nervous systems in the context of olfaction. It works about on these topics in the context of cortical processing, and that's something I'll talk about on Monday for those interested. And it's something that we stumbled across, not really looking for it, uh, while studying this wonderful animal here, and I'm going to now talk about this. So, why are cephalopods um, interesting to neuroscientists? And I'll give you a few reasons and then get into it. So the first one is what I was telling you about, about the squid giant axon, basic biophysics of membrane. Another reason is about brain evolution. And that is absolutely amazing. If you look at the evolution of, of metazoans here, what you see is that uh, the cephalopods, which are mollusks, um, are in this particular branch here, of um, what I call protostomes. Whereas our, bra our branch here is the deuterostome, the chordates, uh, that led to, you don't see them here, uh, all the vertebrates. Now, in both the mollusks, and actually only in the mollusks, and the vertebrates, you find enormous brains. So the brain of, a, of an octopus has on the order of a half a billion neurons. It's enormous. It's the size of the brain of a squirrel, okay? And these have arisen through completely separate paths 
for over 560 million years, evolving from an animal, as I'll show you in the next slide, that most likely had none of those nervous system, none of those properties. Here is a fossil record of an animal that lived around that time that's most likely not an ancestor to both the protostomes and the deuterostomes, but you have an idea of the kind of animals that was our, our ancestor at the time when you had this divergence to what would eventually give enormous brains among some mollusks and the chordates, the vertebrates, mammals, and us. Those brains, even though equally large, are built according to completely different body uh, uh, plans, if you will. The way in which the, the, the networks are formed, the, 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 the circuits are generated, the development of these systems, all of them are different, and yet they generate amazing behaviors, extremely complex behavior, learning abilities, and so on, that are fascinating. Okay. So I think that comparing the organization of these different systems, which are built differently, and arriving at the underlying rules of function of these nervous systems is a way to identify the principles of neural function and circuit function. And of course, we're not there yet, but that's one of the goals. So now I'm going to talk about chromatophores and camouflage in these animals and illustrate the fact that these cephalopods and cuttlefish have absolutely amazing behaviors, as many of you know here, thanks to the work, for example, of Roger Henlon here, and offer unique opportunities to sample activity in their brains by proxy, actually, not by recording directly from them. And so to illustrate these behaviors and camouflage properties, I will use a film that was taken by Roger a number of years ago. I'll let you look at the rock for a few minutes and then turn the movie on. I don't know if Roger is in the room, but I think you will, you'll hear him speak showed me the full repertoire of what it does. And it was like slow motion. It went from camouflage to bright white to scare me, ink on my face. It'll play again just so that you can see. It's it showed me hard the to full believe. repertoire of what it does. And it was like slow motion. It went from camouflage to bright white to scare me, ink on my face. So this is an octopus. Um, it showed me the full repertoire of what it does. Okay, I'll do it a third like time. It's so much fun. It went from camouflage to bright white to scare me, ink on my face. So these animals use and have evolved these uh, phenomena of camouflage or crypsis as a way to evade pred predators, um, uh, to hunt as well. Um, and what's amazing about it is that they don't create a carbon copy of the environment, meaning that if you put them on a newspaper, you can't read the newspaper on their skin. They rather reproduce the statistics of the environment which they observe within limits, but they make some kind of statistical estimation of the structure of the environment in which they're going to camouflage. And this is highly non-trivial. This is something that we can do. We don't know how we can do it. This is something that modern techniques of machine learning allows us to do to some degree, but it allows us to do it with enormous amount of training, with training sets that contain hundreds of thousands of examples, which clearly we don't do, and which clearly they don't do, because they can camouflage when they hatch out of the egg. So they have solutions to these very complicated problems embedded in their nervous system and embedded as well in their genomes. This is fascinating. So let's look at camouflage as a statistical matching. You want to do some kind of match, but not exact, but approximate enough that the potential predators, for example, will not be able to identify the difference. So vision is something which is an extremely complex property of our nervous system which is complicated because most of the tasks that it has to solve are ill-posed, meaning that they have many possible solutions. One example is three dimensions. The image that is formed on our eye is two-dimensional, and yet we have a vivid, in most cases, perception of the world as being three-dimensional. 
So there are many ways that a physical arrangement could generate identical images on the retina, and yet our brain is able to interpret usually the right one. You can fool the brain. For example, if you draw a cube on a piece of paper, the projection of a cube on a piece of paper, and you look at it long enough, you'll see that the cube will flip back and forth depending on something that happens in your brain, which forces you to home in on one particular viewing angle. So the brain is clearly biased in some way, and that bias is a result of the evolution of the brain, which has used the statistics of the natural world to form a nervous system with the appropriate bias, so as to make recognition appropriate. Okay? We use also learning to some degree, of course, so as to learn the statistics of the environment and train our nervous system to make the right inference from an ill-posed input, okay? So let's look at the natural world. The natural world is made of, in the, the, the world of vision, of images, and those images, most of them are highly non-random. So these are two natural images, a landscape, here are sunflowers, and they have a particular statistical structure with bits of images that don't change in contrast. So for example, the sky or the road and so on, where it's sort of uniform. And then boundaries between these regions and others, such as on the edge of the trunk of that tree, for example, which in, 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 in mathematical sense are described by their spatial frequency. So you have a lot of low spatial frequencies, these uniform areas, and a small amount of high spatial frequencies, and there's particular spectral characteristic that's very characteristic of natural images. So that's one part of our visual world. And then you have another one, which is, for example, if you zoomed in on, on the seeds of the sunflower, which is much more statistical, where the details don't seem to matter very much, and we form some kind of an impression of the structure of this image, okay? Tony Mofshan at NYU, who's a neuroscientist, talks, these, talks about these things as these being things and these being stuff. And in fact, this is what natural images are about. There are parts of our things that you can put words on, you can describe, and there's parts of images that are stuff that you can describe sort of, but not in detail, and in fact, it doesn't matter. So these images are completely different. If I showed you 10 natural images of this sort, and then I turned the computer off and I showed you one of them asking you, have you seen that one before? You would be able to say, yes, I saw it. If I did the same thing with these snow patterns, of course you could not. So clearly our nervous system has evolved to recognize these things, but has evolved to recognize these things only statistically and not in detail, okay? So camouflage, makes use of these different ways of seeing the world, and you have examples of both. You have examples of animals that basically camouflage as things, and if you were here for Nipam Patel's talk uh, two weeks ago, uh, you'll have seen a bunch of butterflies that camouflage as leaves, for example. Here's a bunch of frogs, there's three of them in this picture, one here, one there, one there, that also camouflage as leaves. And then you have animals such as cephalopods, there's one here, <laughs> that imitate the statistics of the environment and that do it in different ways depending on the relative scale of the animal to the environment in which they are, okay? And the things that's amazing about these animals is that this is not a single camouflage they can do. They can actually control it adaptively, and this is what's fascinating. So what we have is, with these animals, is something which can be controlled, which is high resolution, and which is a display system just in the same way that a screen is a display system with a bunch of pixels. But those pixels don't work like the ones that we have on the screen. So we're going to zoom in on this animal. And when you zoom in on the animal, this is a movie, so you can see them sort of twinkling. You see that this pattern is actually formed of a bunch of pixels that come in a few colors, and the number of colors varies with the species and so on. Typically, in this one, there's two colors and then something in between, so it's yellows and dark, and then you have a few brown and red ones. And in fact, the color is a function of the age of the chromatophore here. So the one that's yellow here, in three weeks, will have turned black. And the animals, as they grow, keep adding new chromatophores all the time, so the display system is never at steady state. It keeps changing as the animal evolves, or rather ages, and it lives for about a year, okay? <laughs> 
So a lot of work has happened over the past decades from many people to identify the way in which these chromatophores are controlled. So you can see a zoom in on a part of the skin. You can see them here. And the way in which these pixels are controlled is that they can be expanded or contracted as a result of the state of a bunch of, of muscle fibers that are in the equatorial plane. There's about 20 muscles or so per chromatophore. So this pigment cell, this pixel. And the chromatophore is basically a sack of pigments. And that sack can be expanded or contracted passively by the action of these muscles. And these muscles are controlled by a very small number of motor neurons from one to about three. And each motor neuron controls a small number of, of uh, chromatophores, maybe up to a distribution, maybe with up to 10, maybe more in some parts of the body. So that means that if you were able to monitor the state of all the chromatophores on the skin of an animal, you'd in fact be indirectly monitoring the state of the motor neurons that control them individually. In other words, you'd be doing brain imaging or neural imaging by proxy without having to go into the nervous system. So when we started working on this system, that was basically our goal. Let's see if we can develop techniques to image the state of all these chromatophores in real time and look at this activity to try and deduce from the co-activity of these chromatophores the structure of the motor system in the nervous system that controls them and make some predictions about the structure of this control system. So, some of the reasons why these animals are absolutely fantastic for uh, neuroscientists is that you have here a direct readout of their perception of the visual world. They, you give them an image, they give you back an image. You don't need to ask them complicated questions that require training. They just give it to, to you straight away. They solve a very complex problem that's called texture processing, which is a very complex, as I was telling you earlier, a, a, a computational problem. They give you an opportunity to do high-scale neural recording by proxy. And this is a bonus in a sense that we didn't predict, but that I'll illustrate towards the end of the talk. They allow us to look at neural dynamics as well. So the work I'm going to talk about here was done by a group in, in my lab, wonderful postdocs and grad students, Sam Ryder, uh, Theodosia, Jesse, Amber, Marcel, and a collaborator at the Frankfurt Institute of Advanced Studies, uh, physicist uh, Matthias Kaschuber. So as I was saying, we set out to develop techniques to track the chromatophores in real time in behaving animals so as to describe quantitatively the state of the animal in real time. So as you can see, this skin is elastic, the animals move, the animal breathes, the animal change patterns. And one of the problem is to track a given chromatophore from one image to the next. We image at 60 hertz, so one uh, image to 16 milliseconds later, and so on for hours, days, weeks, months, and track those chromatophores over time. Okay. So we have to segment them, identify a given chromatophore, identify its boundary. We have to align the images taken uh, in a film, we have to register these images. This is this process, I'll illustrate this. We have to stitch little parts of movies, some of which are not usable. And then we have to analyze and start doing neuroscience. So I'll illustrate just one of these things. So here's two images of the same animal about 10 minutes apart, where the animal has changed pattern. And the basic problem here is to identify the same chromatophores from this image to that image. So you have on this particular image something like 30,000 different chromatophores. It's a small animal. It's about that big at that time. But we have to be able to track individual chromatophores, even though the animal changes pattern, moves, breathes, and so on. Okay. So what's the problem? What's the way in which we could solve that? And we were lucky to observe that, in fact, the way in which the chromatophores are distributed in the skin is nearly unique, or roughly, um, depending on where they are on the skin. In other words, if you look at a small patch of skin of uh, something like 100 by 100 pixels or so, you'll have a bunch of chromatophores within it. And their spatial distribution in any one position is unique. Okay. 
So that means that if you take a, a small area on the skin of this animal and you now compare it to an area of the same size on the skin of the same animal in another image, okay, and you now do a, a simple computation, it's called a cross correlation, which is some sort of a multiplication, if you wish, between the images, and you do that from your reference uh, uh, area with all possible other areas on the skin of the animal, with all translations and all rotations possible, eventually you'll find only one match. And that match is the correct one that indicates where those chromatophores actually are on the skin of the animal. And so you can do that over a subset of little patches, like 20 or 30 of them, do that repeatedly, and eventually you can align your images exactly one with the other. Of course, you've done that with two images, but you need to do that with a movie. So you need to do that pairwise from one image to the next, to the next, to the next. So you can imagine that this is computationally intensive. You have an image here, which is done by a 4K camera. So it's 4,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels uh, times the number of images per second times the number of seconds in an hour. And over you know two hours of, of recordings, you have an enormous amount of data that you have to analyze. So here is the comparison between this purple area in these two images, and this is the correlation between them showing a match. This is the green area, and that's a more difficult challenge because the texture of this and that is different in the two images, and yet the correlation between them is again high. And so if you measure all possible correlations between two pairs of areas, you'll have a distribution of correlation coefficients around zero, which means that they're different. In this histogram here, you have over 200 million pairwise correlations here. And the actual matches are all here, complete outliers that identifies them as unique and correct. So you can completely identify these matching areas. And so that results in basically Botoxing an image. You have a set of images that are different from one image to the next, eventually you can realign them in something that doesn't move anymore. And I'll illustrate this with this image. So here is the same thing. On the left is the original little piece of movie, and on the right is after this operation I was just describing. So I'll play it. So here's the real thing, the animal moves and so on. And here is the thing after this operation where you have done Botox by software. You've basically paralyzed the skin, everything is in register, and now you can track each one of these individual chromatophores from one time frame to the next, to the next, and so on. Okay? So using this approach, we're basically able to go from images which, if you didn't do it, would look like that. So this is the sum of over 200,000 images, which are all uh, give you something which you cannot interpret, to something like this after our software pipeline, uh, in which you can identify individual chromatophores. Now you're in business. Basically, you have individual chromatophores whose diameter you can track over time. So this was done with a single camera over small animals. We wanted to track them for longer, so we had to build a bigger system with 24 cameras. So we've multiplied everything by 24, and now we can track the animals over a longer period of their lives uh, when they become bigger. And now here's an example where we can track uh, nearly half a million chromatophores over a long period of time. So these are amazing data sets and amazingly useful because now we have data to do statistics in a very deep fashion over a long period of time to try and figure out what controls them and in what way they're correlated with one another so as to deduce the upstream levels of control in their nervous system. So this is what I'm going to describe now, is how we go about dealing with those data sets. So we've gone from uh, these real movies to these images which are stacks of successive images at 16 millisecond interval, and then we can identify a given chromatophore, and then we can track it over time from one image to the next. And as you can see, we can measure the diameter of this chromatophore from one image to the next to the next, and we get a time series where the diameter is along this direct, this uh, uh, dimension, and time along that dimension. So that's one chromatophore, but we can do that over thousands of them in real time. Uh, uh, at that frequency, and we can then 
look at the way in which they're correlated with one another, we can look at what we call the joint statistics of motion of these different chromatophores, and by doing this, deduce something about the way in which they're driven by the nervous system, and I'll explain how that works. So here is uh, the mantle of this animal. This is a period, uh, an area of the skin that we observe. We're zooming in even on a smaller area, and now we're looking at uh, about 25 of those chromatophores and the way in which they change diameter as a function of time. And you can see during this uh, period of time here of a few tens of seconds that all of these glitches that you see going up here represent the expansion of one chromatophore for each line. And so you can see that all these chromatophores do their expansion at the same time. There's a high correlation between them. But you can see that during this period of time here, those same chromatophore, the black ones, continue to be synchronized, whereas these ones are not which means that there's something about their control that's different about them, okay? So let's look at how it could be. So this is a schematic, uh, simplified, for six chromatophores. And what interests us is to deduce from the correlation in their activation something about the nervous system that's upstream of them that controls them. So we can make some hypotheses and guesses about how that could be, and a simple hypothesis is that there is some kind of hierarchy of control with, for example, a bunch of motor neurons. Motor neuron A would control chromatophores 1 and 2, B would control 3 and 4, etc. And you can imagine that every time motor neuron A, which after all is the last stage of the brain controlling this system, every time motor neuron A is active, both of these chromatophores 1 and 2 will be co-active. So they'll be correlated all the time. So their correlation will be maximum 100% or 1. You can imagine that motor neurons A and B are in fact themselves controlled by neurons higher up in the hierarchy. And every time N1, this higher up neuron, is active, motor neurons A and B will be co-active. And therefore, the chromatophores 1 to 4 will be co-active. So they'll be co-active together and the correlation will be high. But some of the time, another control neuron, N2, will be active. And when that one is active, it will have high correlation for all the chromatophores from 3 to 6, but 3 and 4 will now be uncorrelated with 1 and 2. So the degree of correlation between 1, 2, and 3, 4 will decrease. And so by doing this kind of analysis, you can cluster these degrees of correlation and eventually make some guesses about these layers of control that exist in the nervous system. Of course, things are always more complicated, and one of those complications is that instead of being separate, as I drew them here, there is overlap between the innovation of these different chromatophores by different mononeurons. So that makes the analysis of these data sets, of course, more complicated. But you start simple and you try and understand how things work. So the beauty of this is that you can sort of apply those techniques to analyze these data over the entire data set and deduce from that, after a bunch of different techniques, uh, the existence of clusters of correlation, which you can draw here in a hierarchy of correlation, and you can cut slices through them to look at the different levels of this control hierarchy. At the bottom here, are uh, the elements that have a correlation of one, meaning they're the chromatophores, and at the end of every one of these vertical lines is a group of chromatophores that work together all the time. So once you have that, you can say, well, where are those chromatophores on the skin? And there, I'll show you them here, they're on this schematic here, and they're color-coded. For example, one set of chromatophores that are postsynaptic, presumably to the same motor neuron, are those pink ones. Another one is the set of the blue ones that you see here. Another one is the yellow ones, and so on. So this is the smallest level of control, if you will, the smallest level of the detail that an animal can generate by the, co the activation of a given motor neuron. Now you can cut slices through these uh, 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 diagram here at different levels of this hierarchy, and you can go at level J, and at level J you get something like this which are bigger patterns that are actually collections of the small patterns that are so in part K here. And those areas here, 
gives you, for example, a little blob there, or an edge that corresponds to the edge of this square there. And you can form, little by little, bigger and bigger patterns. You can cut a slice at the top level of this hierarchy there, and what you find here is a set of chromatophores that tend to be correlated part of the time to form the inside of the square, and a set of chromatophores that tend to be correlated to form the outside of that square. Okay? So by using this approach and analyzing these data sets, you can little by little form a hypothesis about the control system where you have what you observe and from the analysis of these data sets form some kind of hypothetical hierarchy of control systems going down from the motor neurons to higher and higher levels. And those things must exist in the brain of this animal. Okay. So now I'll talk, and that will be the end of the talk in a couple of slides, about dynamics. And that informs us even more about the structure of this control system. OK? Let me drink a bit before. So I'll start with a behavior which is fascinating, which is one that was observed by uh, Danby Kim, who was a, an undergrad at MIT and spent a summer here with uh, Roger Hanlon, filming these animals while feeding. And I was giving a, she's now a graduate student, finishing graduate student at UCL in, in London, and I was giving a talk uh, earlier this year there, and she heard my talk, and she came to see me afterwards, and she said, I did this work in, in, in Roger's lab, and, you know, I, I would like to uh, analyze this and so on. So I said, well, come to my lab, let's uh, film this, and let's look at that together. So she paired up with Theodosia and Sam here, and I'll show you a movie of that stuff. So it's absolutely fascinating, because at the end of this stick here is a shrimp that you can't quite see. And the animal here is going to try and catch that shrimp. And they do that by throwing out their tentacles forward. And when you do that, you basically are playing with a cat. It's absolutely amazing to watch a, a mollusk uh, behaving in a way which reminds you uh, of, of, of a, a feline. So now I ask you to look at the mantle of this animal. You see that every time it strikes, and in fact, if it catches the animal, it has a reaction which is different from the one that it shows when it fails. It generates some kind of weird sequence of patterns, the adaptive value of which we don't know, but which are fascinating to see, okay? so. If you use some of the techniques of, of image uh, um, botoxing, as I was describing it earlier, you'll get something like this, where now you'll see the animal immobile by software and the environment moving around it. You, you can look at these patterns evolving over time as a function of what the animal is doing. So you can analyze these data sets. And I'll show you a gross analysis of this kind of data set and then go to a, another kind of behavior with a fine analysis. So these patterns and the change in pattern, the animal as a function of time in this behavior, can be actually described as a sequence of structures on the mantle, which you can coarse grain. And this is a coarse grain description. The contrast is not good on the image, but there's a, a set of images that represent the sequence of basic states that the animal goes through. And you can, throughout many repeats of these kinds of behavior, then describe these sequences in this way and plot these different patterns in a 2D plot such as this one. And so the behavior of the animal is basically a sequence going through states, which is shown by this diagram in two dimensions, which of course is much more complicated in real life, uh, but can be summarized by this sequence of states. Okay? So now I'm going to show you another behavior, which is a different one, where the animal is immobile. Amber, who's a grass student, moves her hand here, and the animal then blanches, turns white like this. Uh, which is a typical reaction if you don't bug them too much, and then returns to its initial state over about a minute, okay? And that takes about a minute to return. 
And note that it went from dark mostly to white mostly to this kind of intermediate state where he has this uh, band, the, the, the white square which you saw, I showed you earlier. And if we wait a few more seconds or so, you see that eventually the animal will turn black again. This entire cycle takes about a minute. So you can repeat it, move your hand again, and the animal will go through the same sequence of states. Now, this animal, because it's immobile in this way, we can actually look at the state of each one of these chromatophores and describe its state image by image in a very quantitative manner as a vector of chromatophore states. And I'll explain how that goes. So, what we have here is an image that represents the state at, the, at time zero, right, when the animal is just resting there. And now we want to look at the evolution of its state as a function of time, okay? So imagine that this animal had two chromatophores only. We could plot the diameter of one chromatophore on the x-axis, the diameter of the second chromatophore on the y-axis, and at any image, we could plot the state of the system as basically a point within that two-dimensional space, where x is one chromatophore, y is the second chromatophore, okay? And we'd observe that the system is basically moving around in that space, that state space. Of course, it has, in this case, tens of thousands of chromatophores, but we can do the same thing, except we do it in 20,000 dimensions rather than two dimensions. Of course, we can't see 20,000 dimensions, and we have to project them in a way that we can see, such as you see them here. So there are a bunch of mathematical techniques that allow you to do this when you take certain decisions about what you want to emphasize. So this is a summary of this evolution of these images as a function of time, and every one of these points represents an image such as this one with 17,000 dimensions. The next step is the next image, 16 milliseconds later, et cetera, et cetera. So the movie that I showed you is in fact a loop that goes like this, okay? It takes about a minute, and what I described you with the movie can be described by that loop here in these two dimensions. Now comes the stuff that's interesting which is that if you repeat the same thing, you move your hand again, the animal moves again, changes color, goes from this to that, it turns white, and then it returns to the black state, and it follows exactly the same trajectory, meaning it transitions from one image to the next, to the next, to the next, following nearly exactly the same patterns, okay? So I'll show you that in this example, where you have three images that are taken each one during one of three successive loops that are taken a few minutes apart, okay? And so they're zooming in on this particular border there in the bit point somewhere here as the animal returns to the dark state and the arrows that you'll see here point to a bunch of chromatophores at the edges and if you compare these arrows from one chromatophore to, from one image to the next, you'll see that they're nearly identical in the state that they take. Okay, so that's, to me, fascinating for the following reason. It implies that there is something extremely deterministic in the way in which the system transitions from one state to another. It goes through a set, a set of intermediate states which is very well defined. So, as we were saying earlier, this system is a motor system. Okay, and motor systems have lots of physical constraints. When I move my hands, my hands move in certain ways that are constrained by the fact that I have bones and muscles and I cannot do just any motion. If you think about the Ministry of, of Silly Walk sketch by, by Monty Python, uh, you remember that most walks look silly simply because they're not physically likely, they're not energetically logical, they're not useful, and they're not the ones that the physics of bodies use. And that is due to some adaptation between the way in which systems, motor systems work and the physics of the plant that the system is uh, moving. But this is very different because there's no physical plant, there's no bones, there's no such mass that the animal has to move. 
when one chromatophore moves, it doesn't impact on its neighbors. And you may have seen that on the earlier movies at high resolution. Which means that in principle, the animal could change from one image to the next in a complete, completely arbitrary fashion, but it does not. And we think that the reason it does not is that there is a constraint, which in this, in this case is not physical, but is neural. And that neural constraint is something about the structure of the nervous system that enables this transition of states. And the fact that these transitions are so repeatable implies that the dimensionality of these states, the space within which they can exist, is reduced. In neurobiological terms, it would mean that, for example, the number of neurons that generate these transitions has to be reduced. In other words, in the hierarchical representation of control that I was describing earlier, the hypothesis is that somewhere at the peak of this pyramid of control exists a low dimensional control system whose existence is the reason why we have this high reliability of motor output. Okay? So by interpreting the data in the way that I described here, you can eventually form some kind of global hypothesis about the motor control here, where you have what we observe, these sets of chromatophores, we have the motor neurons, and then you have higher levels of controls so that eventually go to some kind of putative, hypothetical at this point, low dimensional representation, which is what we would like to find. Because this is probably the point at which the interfacing with the statistical estimation of the visual world is done. So the game here for many years or decades to come is to figure out really how this is actually done. And so we're just starting, and a bunch of labs hopefully will start as well, for example, by recording from the nervous system of these animals to try and see whether these predictions are actually met by the, rec the recordings that we make. This will be long. <laughs> so what I want to say here is I hope I have shown you that cephalopods are incredibly interesting to neuroscientists for a variety of reasons. They are for a unique window uh, uh, to a brain and amazingly interesting behavior and action and motor control. They allow us to develop techniques to analyze very large data sets, which in this case are neural by proxy. But the developmental, the development of techniques for recordings from the brain is, is going at very high speed. And eventually, we'll have recordings from the brain of tens of thousands of neurons simultaneously. And the problem is to figure out how we can analyze and get out interesting principles from them. And the problem with the brain is that very often, you don't really know what neurons are recording from, and you don't know what position they are in the circuits. Here, we have a set of putative neurons that are all at the output. So we know what they are. And therefore, if we are ever able to understand the way in which the brain is organized, we should be able first to figure out how these motor systems output is actually organized. So this is part of the reason why I think this is important to do. Another reason is that we hope that this will give us some evolved biological solutions to a very fascinating and complex problem, which is that of texture matching and texture perception. And as a result, identify general principles of motor function. So to finish, what I would like to do is, is acknowledge uh, a number of, of, of people uh, who have been instrumental uh, in all this work. and. Um, I would like to acknowledge all the wonderful students, PhD students, postdocs that have been in my lab, both when I was at Caltech and now in, in Frankfurt, uh, who have contributed to all the research they have done uh, over the past 30 years. The work that I described on cephalopods was done by Sam, Jesse, Marcel, Theodosia, Amber. I would like to acknowledge also the funders of this research. This is tremendously important. The Max Planck Society, the European Research Council, doing this kind of research is kind of really open-ended, somewhat non-classical in a sense, and I think it's tremendously important to have funders realize that this kind of research is relevant for the research that's done on other systems. And um, 
I am incredibly grateful to them for allowing me to carry out this kind of research. I'd like to thank MBL, University of Chicago, for supporting and, and, and now uh, running uh, MBL. It's, as I was saying earlier, an incredibly important uh, part of biological research and chemical research in the world. I'd like to thank Roger Hanlon, who's been incredibly welcoming to me when uh, I, I needed some space in his lab to work a few summers ago. I'd like to acknowledge and thank Josh Rosenthal, who is also a scientist here at MBL, working on cephalopods and on uh, genetic aspects of cephalopods. And Josh has very kindly hosted one of my graduate students, uh, Mathieu Renard, over the past six months uh, to work on a variety of developmental uh, uh, issues having to do with developing techniques to bring genetics in these model systems. I'd like to thank Brett Grasser here, who's been also incredibly useful and helpful in uh, helping us raise these animals in an environment such as Frankfurt, which is not known for its ocean. <laughs> I'd like to recognize the importance of the summer courses and um, I think the students who are in the audience don't realize yet how important those courses are to their career, their thinking, and their way of, of doing science. And I'd like to finally thank the Grass Foundation uh, for all their support and research here and this Forbes lecture. Thank you very much. much for a really amazing lecture. We, we have a little time for questions if people would like okay. to ask them. We have more some people. Uh, yes, you need uh, I'm just a bit curious about one thing. Um, have you done any kind of tests relating to the cuttlefish's ability uh, when hunting to uh, do those mesmerizing patterns? Not, not in these species. Some, some species do that. We haven't really looked at that in, in, in any of the species that uh, show this particular behavior. It's, it's, uh, you've seen probably this in aquaria. Uh, and it's, it's uh, as you said, mesmerizing. But a lot of these behaviors are honestly very odd and, and somewhat difficult to explain. Uh, their adaptive value is sort of mysterious and you're somewhat forced to emit hypotheses about why they evolve, but we often don't know, really. Is it difficult to replicate in the laboratory? No, no, that's not difficult to replicate in the lab laboratory. No, 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 it's not. But, but it's just that we haven't looked at that particular uh, issue. We've looked at some certain species, the flamboyant uh, cuttlefish, for example, that has these waves running along its body. Uh, there are some here, actually, I think, in, in, in one of the rooms. On the, um, and and um, they themselves enable one to tackle completely different types of problems of motor coordination and wave patterns that are also very interesting physical problems. The neurons that control the chromatophores also affect the texture of the skin? So they appear to be different. The ones that control the diameter of the chromatophores um, are ones that control the muscles that form these stars that I showed you in one of the images. The uh, three-dimensional texture of the animal is caused by a specialized structure that I call papillae, and those are controlled by other motor neurons and other muscles that are separate, but of course they're coordinated in some way that we know even less about. So two related questions. If you look across two cuttlefish, do they always solve the problem the same way? Or is there a learning that allows one cuttlefish to be a little different than another? It's a very good question. We don't know yet, and these are some of the issues that we'll have to, to address is, in a sense, and Roger has worked on, on this particular issue for, for uh, a number of years. One of the key questions is to 
figure out how many different patterns they're able to generate and whether the space of possible patterns is limited or not. So you can get the beginning of answers from the analysis of the, the data sets that I showed you here, but the data set that we have are actually don't represent the entire repertoire that these, these animals generate. So, so you need enormous data sets to actually do the, the proper statistics, and then you have to do that across different animals to figure out whether they s solve it in different ways. We're not there yet. And that feeds to my follow-on question, which is if you define intelligence as the complexity of the dendrogram, and you look across a population of cuttlefish, are some smarter? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be dead by the time we can answer that question. <laughs> If you, if you look at something like the dynamics, which you talked about how, you know, you wave your hand and you get this reproducible sort of, you know, patterns of everything. What if you go from animal to animal? Is it... This is, is it, a reliable behavior that you'll see in many animals. Okay, I, I don't want to say that you'll see it every time. So they have different thresholds. Uh, some of them don't like it at all and they'll ink and so it varies. But this is a very reliable behavior. But down to the sub-patterns and the... You know, so how much of it yeah. really seems hardwired and how much so, so, of it is... So this is similar to the other question, which is that when you look at this, unless you do an analysis chromatophore by chromatophore, you just get a gist of what the image and the sequence is, right? It's a, so you're forced to cluster in a way which is somewhat arbitrary. So to answer this question properly, I think you have to do it at the resolution of the system, which is at the chromatophore level. And, and compare across animals. And so we haven't done that yet. But, but it's a very important question, of course. Yeah. Question about, earlier in the talk, you were talking about how you uh, lined up the images. Yes. By checking on, I was just wondering if you took advantage of the fact that you know, a nearby cell should be relatively similar to the one next to it. Simplify the, not try every single rotation. Like yeah, we, we, we don't do we don't do 360. We we, we have a, a a smaller range typically that we do, we've arrived at empirically, so as to simplify the problem. Of course, we cannot we don't have enough time and computer power to do this. This thing uh, is done on on the the Max Planck Society supercomputers. Uh, and the analysis of a data set such as this one uh, that I showed you, which is typically a couple of hours or so on, uh, will take many days. So, so we have to simplify the problem. We have to simplify every single stage of the pipeline. And, and um, uh, at the moment, we're still using this cross-correlation, but we've simplified many of the aspects, such as the segmentation of the chromatophores, for example, where we use deep learning now, which we didn't uh, a year ago. Yeah. Uh, so can uh, they perceive each other? Like, can they see each other when one of them is camouflaged? Like, can they tell that the other one is there? <laughs> I don't know. That's a question for Roger. I, 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 um, I, 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 I will guess an answer that sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. <laughs> I think that's probably a really good note on which to, to leave the, the, quest, the formal questions. We will all go to the reception in the Okay, I'll be happy to, to answer all the questions. Thank you. Thank you.